blue, red. It's the 2021 battle of the mid-range CPUs. There's a lot of six core, 12 thread goodness going on right now and an intruder into the mid-range price space. Which CPU should you get? Let's do a comprehensive rundown today and see if it's team blue or team red for the win. Welcome to Machines and More. With the introduction of the Intel i5-11600K recently, the choice for a gaming CPU has never been more agonizing. With that, here I think it is a good time to do a mid-range CPU battle to see which one is a good choice for your productivity or gaming rig. Now that sweet spot has always been around $300 for a good consumer gaming CPU. So your i5s and your Ryzen 5s and you know, competition is great. This is a really special time because AMD and Intel are just so close for this particular iteration. Now the 11600K is kind of the impetus for this comparison and this one is the Rocket Lake 11 gen 6 core 12 thread offering from intel and it features a base clock of 3.9 gigahertz and an all core boost of 4.6 gigahertz and a single core turbo of 4.9 gigahertz the pl1 power limit is 125 watts that's the long duration power limit and the pl2 or the short duration is 251 watts quite a lot these chips can in theory burst up to that 251 watt figure when given enough thermal headroom. Now without getting into too much detail, despite still being 14 nanometer process, the 11th gen Intel CPUs are not Skylake derivatives like the 10700K here is. Instead, they utilize a new Cypress Cove architecture, which is a variation of the Sunny Cove architecture from their 10th gen mobile CPUs. And with that, Intel claims a 19% IPC or instructions per cycle gain. Now, this chip is priced a little bit lower at around 260, 270 US, but it is placed to compete with the gaming sweet spot champ in the $300 AMD Ryzen 5 5600X, which is also a six core 12 thread part, but it is a seven nanometer process with dramatically lower power limits. TDP corresponds to the long duration power limit and the Ryzen 5 chip is spec'd at 65 watts. And AMD typically specs a PPT or pa package power tracking number of 88 watts for their 65 TDP chips. And when this chip is pushed hard in a little bit of an overclock, it will hit that 87, 88 watts figure. And so that's the upper limit figure that would compare to the whopping 251 watts on the 11600K. And the surprise entrant into the <laughs> mid-range battle is the i7-10700K, which has seen a fairly big price drop into the 300-ish dollar space, which essentially lands it into the price bracket for this competition. But it did actually start life out at $400. And that 10700K is an eight core 16 thread part. The two extra cores should in theory give it a good advantage in heavier multi-threaded workloads. You might notice that I've left out the Zen 2 3700X, which is a chip I really like myself, but empirically the newer 10700K trades blows with the 3700X for multi-threaded processes while typically being better for gaming. So unfortunately with the 10700K dropping into the $300 price back bracket, in fact, frequently now the 10700K is cheaper, the 3700X gets left out of this round. So we'll quickly get into the benchmarks and then after that I'll share my impressions and just give a recommendation. So I'm gonna approach this with a slight bias towards gaming usage since I think that's where the mid-range typically tends to cater to, but these benchmarks will definitely give you an idea on the multi-threaded performance as well. And just a quick rundown on test specs. I am testing here with the RTX 3080 FE and two mini ITX boards uh, for the Intel CPUs. I'm using MSI's Z490 Unify. And for the AMD CPU, Gigabyte's B550 Aorus ITX. Uh, both are very good boards within their respective chipsets and are more than sufficient to run these CPUs. The Z490 is housed in the N-Case M1 V6 and the B550 in the Sliger SX20, but I am keeping both of these cases open to mitigate any difference between the two and that won't be an issue. And so for cooling, I am running all these chips on one of my favorite little coolers, the Noctua U9S Chromax with push-pull fans running at about 80%. And I did want to throw in a moderately powered cooler to better represent the typical cooling choices for this price range, which could range anywhere from between a basic air cooler, just like the stock cooler on the 5600X, 
to an all-in-one liquid cooler like a 240 or 280. Now, since the channel does tend to gravitate towards the small form factor space, the U9S is a good middle ground to tread. Now, unless noted otherwise for a few specific tests, the CPUs are kept at stock. Uh, the AMD is on PBO Auto. Uh, by default but without any curve optimizer settings enabled and the intel chips are set to allow full use of pl2 but on stock settings otherwise and there is one important thing to note and i might talk about this in a dedicated video but with rocket lake comes new memory support now officially with 11th gen chips 3200 megahertz ram is officially supported but for rocket lake intel <laughs> introduces a user selectable gear mode for memory similar to the UCLK and the MCLK ratios for Ryzen. Now gear one is a one to one ratio between the integrated memory controller and the RAM and gear two would be a two to one ratio which means your memory controller clock would be severely reduced. So for chips other than the 11900K, 3200 megahertz RAM is officially supported only up to gear two which means that in gear one which would otherwise be stock with AMD ever since Zen 2 is technically an overclock with Intel. Now with 10th gen Intel, it's already an overclock, but you may see some reviews where it looks like the 11700K or the 11600K are getting trashed by even the 10th gen CPUs. And that may be because gear two is being selected in the motherboard's BIOS, or they're doing a comparison in gear two. Now I'll get to this towards the end of the benchmarks, but you really do need to pay attention to this since for the most part, gear one, at 3200 megahertz should be okay and probably the best setting right now since it's only a moderate overclock. Now, one problem I encountered when I was testing was uh, with a 3600 megahertz CL16 kit and the 10700K, which posted fine, but the 11600K would not post with this RAM kit in gear one. So I stuck to a 3200 CL16 kit for a more fair comparison. Although I'll mention later on in the recommendations that this is not a favorable situation for the 11600K. So kicking off with some synthetic benchmarks here in Cinebench Multicore, we'd expect the 10700K to top the charts and it does. With a heavier turbo setting in the motherboard, you would typically see the 10700K hit 12K and above, but this was strictly keeping within the stock parameters of an up to 4.7 gigahertz all core boost. The 5600X gets remarkably close as well for only being a six core 12 threaded part. Cinebench R23 single core shows how potent Zen 3 is. Certainly the 11th gen Intel looks to have made some serious improvements on the IPC or instructions per cycle front, but it still trails here. And 3D Mark Time Spy CPU test is a good indicator of overall CPU performance. The 10700K with the two extra cores is clearly top of the charts here. And the 5600X and the 11600K are very closely matched. With DaVinci Resolve, I encoded the recent EG200 review from 4K to H264 in 1080 and recorded the time it took for the CPU to render out the clip. Now, more cores should win here, but again, the 5600X is remarkably close. Blackmagic has an 8K RAW benchmark. This measures out how many frames per second of RAW footage can be decoded by the CPU, and the 10700K wins that handily. In Blender's pavilion scene, we round out the multi-threaded hierarchy of these three chips, and with that, it's pretty obvious that the 10700K is clearly the absolute best for productivity, but amazingly, the 5600X is really close behind, and both these CPUs easily eclipse the 11600K. Now, getting to our gaming benchmark, CSGO is an old title, but there are some pretty high frame rates involved, so it is an interesting benchmark. Not a whole lot of difference here with this training course as a repeatable test, but it is a fun benchmark nonetheless. Red Dead 2 is typically heavy on the GPU, but certainly scenes from the in-game benchmark do see the CPU utilized pretty heavily. And bringing settings down a tad to get the frame rates up allows for a good comparison here. The 11600K here is the notable underperformer for this title in 1440 and 1080. Far Cry 5 is an old title, but is typically CPU bound, so it's really good to test this one. The 10700K and the 11600K kind of flip-flop in terms of performance between 1080 and 1440, but they are pretty similar. And this one does see the 5600X fall behind. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is typically GPU bound, but here the 5600X tops out in that performance. 
And Civ 6 Gathering Storm will round out our FPS benchmarks here. The 10700K does win this one with the 11600K and the 5600X mostly the same. You don't really need high frame rates, it's just an interesting test. A unique gaming benchmark with Gathering Storm though is the AI turn time benchmark and this one is a test of the CPU. The 11600K does get the nod here. A quick check on all core render thermals just shows how easy the 5600X is to cool. And with identical cooling, the Intel chips run more than 20 degrees hotter. For gaming with the RTX 30 FE and Red Dead 2, I measured power draw at the wall and yeah, it's pretty clear the 5600X is just a lot more efficient. Now as a wrap up to these performance tests, these three chips tend to be remarkably close to each other in terms of gaming performance. They tend to trade places based on the title. And the reality is that any of these would be an excellent CPU for gaming. And certainly I don't think we're in the territory where the difference is significant to choose one over the other, just based on gaming performance. The other takeaway here is that the 11600K isn't quite the gaming champ that Intel might market it or want it to be. It's not bad, but it's certainly not outstanding either. So a few recommendations, if you're after absolute multi-threaded performance and this is your budget, then yes, the 10700K absolutely has a definite advantage here, and it should. With a more aggressive turbo boost, it is easily capable of much more performance, but you do have to be intentional about cooling it. At the same time, while workstation tasks aren't really the 5600X's intended forte, it is awfully close to the 10700K in a lot of multi-core tests, and this chip has another trick up its sleeve, courtesy of AMD's PBO and Curve Optimizer. So Curve Optimizer is a new to Ryzen 5000 dynamic undervolting profile that you can set up in your motherboard's BIOS. And it will allow you to give the chip less power without sacrificing performance. And with the extra thermal headroom for using less power, it can clock higher. And coupled with that PBO maxed out, you can hit some pretty awesome clocks without really too much tweaking at all. Now, being technically an overclock, this is silicon dependent. So take these figures with a slight grain of salt. With just a negative 20 offset in BIOS for this 5600X, it was able to hit 4.7 gigahertz on all cores. Of course, this comes at a jump in thermals, but with the same cooling, this is still significantly lower than either of the Intel chips at stock. So you really don't need any fancy cooling to get a decent overclock for the 5600X. Likewise, with just a plus one turbo boost to get to an all core clock of 4.8 gigahertz, the 10700K still leads here, but thermals were getting into the 90s, 90 plus here, and without upgrading the cooling, there's really not much more you can do here. So on an apples to apples basis, I think even for multi-threaded workloads that aren't mission critical, which again, you're shopping for a mid-range chip here, right? It wouldn't be a bad choice to go with the 5600X, and for me, the curve optimizer is reason enough to go with it. For sure though, the 11600K is not a good choice if you're even considering multi-threaded performance. Now, here's my general recommendation. If what you're doing is an in-socket upgrade, so if you have a B450, a B550, an X470, X570 motherboard that can be upgraded to BIOS support for Ryzen 5000, or a Z490 motherboard for Intel's 10th gen, then I'd say just stick with the socket you have already. And so if you have an AMD motherboard, just go with the 5600X and vice versa. The differences aren't stark enough to warrant a board change, and certainly I think this will likely favor the 5600X a bit more, since the B450 and X470 platforms have simply been around longer, which means a more meaningful upgrade is there, such as from a 2600 to a 5600X. Now, if you have a Z490 board already, you're at least on some Comet Lake chip, and I don't know that that upgrade would make much sense. Certainly not necessarily to the 11600K. And I would expect there to be few folks that make that single generation change. If you're on a 10600K and you just want a little bit more performance, maybe you should be getting like a 10850 or a 10900K, right? So if you're planning on getting a new MOBO anyway for this CPU choice, then I think the 5600X would be my single magical recommendation. Now, first off, the total package price is a big consideration here. Even though this 11600K is priced lower than the 5600X, and the 10700K is on par with the 5600X, both these Intel chips need either the Z490 or the Z590 platform to run at its best. And in the real world, 
The 5600X pretty much runs at its best, whether it's on a B550 or X570 board. And personally, I just go for the B550. If we look just at the MOA stack for a single brand, say Gigabytes or a Solite, the Z490 or the Intel chipset is priced at 230. The X570 is 210 and the B550 is 170. So in other words, the roughly equivalent Intel MOBA is between $20 to $60 more than the AMD one. If you're a fan of ITX boards, the Z490 or Elite, it's 290. The X570 is 230 and the B550 is like 200 right now. So anywhere between a $60 to $90 advantage for AMD. Now from what I've seen, I don't think liquid cooling is strictly necessary for the 11600K but the 5600X is without question easier to cool. And you really could get by with a lot less cooler the 5600X, such as with the excellent ID SE224 XT, or the U9S is great too. Uh, this is a simply a more elegant solution using less power, generating less heat, which is good for your system as a whole. And as much as I eschew the stock coolers with AMD CPUs, there's no denying the fact that it's at least worth something whether as an item to give, to sell, to trade, or to keep around as a backup. And perhaps it's worth as much as the integrated graphics on the Intel chips that you may or may not benefit from. AMD has an advantage here, and perhaps it might be easier to get the 11600K now in terms of availability. But then again, I don't think the 5600X is difficult to get, and I think it's well worth being patient for. And Availability is getting better. On top of that, if you prefer high speed RAM kits, AMD is the absolute way to go. Now, I don't think that most Ryzen aficionados since Zen 2 think twice about slapping a 3600 megahertz RAM kit on their builds, right? And with the 11600K, my 36 megahertz kit just would not post at gear one. <laughs> and I tried it at gear two and it was terrible. So you're better off running a gear one 3200 megahertz kit. Now this may be a BIOS bug since it's still pretty early in the chip's life cycle, but as you saw with apples to apples RAM at gear one for the 11600K, there really wasn't much reason to choose it. And even the 10700K posted and ran just fine with the 3600 megahertz RAM kit. Now it's not that the 11600K is a bad chip and I don't think you'll be disappointed with it, but I do have reservations about that integrated memory controller. And at first glance, it's really not as good as the 10700K right now. I really wanted to like the 11600K, but so far I can't say I do. AMD's process is simply more graceful and given that both AM4 and LGA1200 are presumed to be a dead end path, you also have a better set of future upgrade options in the 5900X and the 5950X. So absolutely, if you don't already have a Z490 board, the 5600X has my recommendation all the way. I'd choose it over the 3700X, I'd choose it over the 10700K, it is that good. The 11600K is kind of like a huge giant that brags about moving a big boulder when the 5600X is off to the side, this little dude cranking on the lever and swinging that same bolt around like a boss. And because of that, I think this is one heck of a lean, mean, processing machine. So that'll do it for this comparison. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm curious what you think. So please leave a comment down below if you've made a choice between these and go ahead and like if you enjoyed it and subscribe. Thanks for watching today.